In the gallant days when history hung on the flight of an arrow or the slash of a sword. When feudal barons ravaged the countryside to live in pomp and splendor. It is truly colorful, exciting, fascinating entertainment every minute of the way. Moon Sea Adventures. Hello and welcome to the Moon Sea Adventures. We are back and uh, you guys have had a little downtime since your last adventure. Uh, Jaunt, I know that you uh, you went shopping with your hard yeah. coin and and you upped yourself with uh, quite a bit of of uh, hardy supplies and adventuring gear to help you um, with your your adventuring. Um, and in turn, um, Angler, I'm not sure if you ended up going for any shopping or not. Um, if you have updated your sheet. But uh, but you definitely had a little bit of rest and downtime, which was good for both of you guys. Um, and a couple weeks have gone past, and in that couple weeks, you know, in addition to shopping um, and resting, relaxing, what uh, what have you guys been doing in your downtime during those weeks? Uh, I will start with Angler. Uh, I'd say mostly just looking for more work, spending time with my buddy John and uh, Harley, you know, I yeah. can't really talk myself. So I just kind of follow their lead. Okay. And, uh, and I will say that the, your, your experience so far has been that uh, it's been kind of slow work wise um, for, for all of you guys. Uh, Captain Leto's, you know, you, you've done check-ins with him periodically and he's just been like, yeah, there's not a lot going on right now. The weather's been kind of crummy, a lot of rain. Um, there hasn't been a lot of, you know, action in the port, uh, but he'll keep you posted kind of thing. Um, Jaunt, how about you? How have you spent uh, some of your time in the downtime? Uh, I think in general, just uh, sort of... Uh connecting with any travelers that come through like proselytizing in my own special way, which is just like, you know, hanging out drinking, smoking with people and telling, you know, far long and stories and, and uh, just trying to have good positive connections with people and spread the good word of, of the wandering God. Um, and uh, uh, keeping a wary eye out for, you know, I know we work with the red plume guys, but uh, after some of the things that they said, after we got back on the last adventure, the fact that they um, were surprised we survived and um, you know, the fact that they didn't expect um, I, I'm torn between uh, wondering, you know, if they sent me along with to make sure they didn't, you know, the other guys didn't die or if they're like, here's another weirdo outsider let's let's uh take care of this guy too and 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 have him disappear underground so yeah. i'm kind of kind of sketchy and and uh wary of of that whole thing and the um the zentarum i had a question are those the one-eared guys the zentarum um or is that another outfit that you are to worry about you've never encountered the zentarum directly okay um you've heard rumors You've heard rumors that the Zentarum are uh, essentially a, a corrupt organization that, that is trying to gain political influence sort of throughout the whole region and that they are based out of Zental Keep. Um, you've heard in even, you know, uh, more kind of cryptic things like that they are a cult and that actually they are um, devotees to an evil god of death. Um, you've also heard kind of rumors that the Zentarum are uh, almost like mercenaries for hire, um, but they tend to work for uh, sort of cruel and wicked um, clients. So your, your, your knowledge is sort of that of secondhand and thirdhand information, but you don't have any first-hand exposure as of yet to the Zentarum. Okay. The uh, welcomers were the ones with the cut-off ears, right? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. welcomers. Sorry. That's who it was. Um, your, 
Yeah, well, the welcomers you're you're familiar with, um, and and you haven't had any run-ins with them as of yet. But then again, it has been kind of slow in the last few weeks. Um, you guys know that, like I said, you've you've had opportunities to check in, and in one such case, you check in, um, and Captain Leto invites you into his office, and. Um, Harley is is not there. I'm going to say that Harley's kind of out and about doing his own thing. Um, but Captain Leto invites you into his office and he says, uh, I have a I have a job for you. Um, it's a client. And uh, it's a job that requires discretion. Um, my client is looking for a book. Uh, the book is apparently valuable, maybe magical, don't really know, but um, the client would like to be in possession of this book. The only problem is, is that it is not owned by him or his family. The book was owned by another family who used to have a lot of influence in Flan but moved north a few decades ago. Uh, they, they expanded their land holdings. They bought uh, an old manor from another family that lived to the north of Flan, and they moved. Uh, my client isn't sure about this other family because they, after moving decades ago, have not come back to Flan. But he would like to have this book in his possession. And he is willing to pay a fat price. Now, um, I happen to know a couple things about this. I happen to know that the family that moved to the north, they don't, uh, they don't live up north anymore. In fact, nobody does. Uh, the family in question are the Antonies. And the Antonies, as far as anyone knows, they abandoned their manor and left the region about 10 years ago. As far as the red plumes know, you could still find that manor. It's a two-day hike up north. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere. And there's a lot of different rumors about what happened to the Anthonys. Some people say that they were threatened and driven out of their manor and off of their lands. Some people say that there was something that spooked them away from that place. Uh, I don't know for sure what the deal is, but I do know that uh, you're not looking at a, a simple task of just going up there, knocking on the door and asking for a book. I was looking to hire five people for this job. Um, I don't know if your friend Harley would be interested or not, but even if he is, you still got to fill out two more, two more people. So take a couple hours, go find your friend, talk it over, and uh, let me know if you're interested in this task. And by all means, if you're not, I'll find other people who will, because again, the pay seems to be pretty extraordinary. Well, I can tell you right now that uh, a two-day hike to the middle of nowhere is music to my ears. And middle of nowhere, that's one of my favorite places. What about you, Angler? And I nod and uh, write on the board favorite places instead of saying it. Okay. Well, that's good. Tell you what, come back in a couple hours. I'm going to see if I can find a couple stout, uh, you know, strong soldier types that could accompany you on account of the fact that. Uh, if push comes to shove and you get in any real heavy fighting, you might want some some muscle. Uh, but you know, go ahead and talk to your uh, 
your guy Harley too, to see if he wants in on the job. And I'll see you in a couple hours. Will do. Thanks, Captain. He nods. Um, you guys pass Dens on the way out, and you go down into the uh, tavern, and you see Harley. Um, he seems to be um, slumbering in a corner. Um, there are several empty tankards near him and a plate of half-eaten e half lamb. Um, you wake him up. He is suffering from a throbbing headache, but he seems to be interested in this task, and he's willing to come with, especially when you mention that there's some large pay involved. Um, as you guys are, uh, kind of waiting, killing time, um, Denz actually comes downstairs and he, he, he walks up to the three of you and he says, uh, Lido's got a couple ideas about some guys to fill out the rest of your group, but he wants to talk to you first. Come back up. Grab a, a hunk of lamb off, uh. Uh, Harley's plate because he's not going to finish it. No, nope. munch that, munch that on the way up the stairs. Indeed, you do. Um, so you guys get back up there, and uh, and you see Captain Lido, and he says, uh, "Well, he's like I was giving it some thought. Now, I didn't know what kind of uh, folks you wanted to fill it out, but I've got a few." Got a few uh, options here for you. So I figured I'd run it past you. Uh, one of the guys is a um, new guy, kind of untested, not really sure about, uh, you know, loyalties, but he seems to have the skills. Um, and he's also a ranger. He's a little bit more focused on uh, the wilderness, on hunting, uh, and he's solid with a bow. Yeah. Uh, the other guy uh, happens to be um, somebody who I've used for a bunch of different things. Um, to put it simple, he's good with an axe and a shield. Um, if things get thick on a you know close-up basis, um, he's pretty well armored and and pretty savvy in battle. Now the third one is uh, less reliable in combat but does know his way around the arcane. Uh, he's a wizard. Now he's, you know, a little bit younger and still kind of learning his way around things, but uh, he, he seems to, you know, be pretty knowledgeable. He studied, actually. Um, so he's, he's kind of learned his way around. Um, so uh, what's your thought? Out of those three, uh, which of the two would you want to have to round out your group? Hmm. Well, <clears throat> perhaps I could uh, confer with my associate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Just let me know um, so that we have time to reach out and find them and bring all this together. Right. On the board, I'm oh. going to write, we need the ranger for tracking. Ranger, that's, that, that, that makes sense. I think it's significant that he seems to value these individuals he's not sending them off to their death so that's a good sign better than better than last time so um but yeah i agree about the ranger and perhaps the so we're picking two yeah uh, perhaps the uh the wizard i mean i'm not not overly familiar with the those of the magic use but uh i i, I would like to learn more and they in the old stories and tales, they seem to uh, be critical and crucial to successful adventuring. I'll agree, I'll agree with the wizard. Just nod my head, put a little check on the board. Then again, the, the fellow with the axe and the shield, I mean, if push comes to shove, perhaps he could do some pushing and shoving. That never hurts. For that, I'll just take my knife out and make a stab motion. 
point to myself. I got that. Oh, yeah. True. Well, Ranger and Wizard then? Yes. Ranger and Wizard. Uh, <laughs> and just, then, look, just as you guys are making this decision, your friend Harley seems to rise again from his slumbered spot in the corner. And he uh, looks up and he says, Ranger Wizard. And then he passes out again. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, hi, guys. Hey, V. Hey. Harley, you, you've arrived just in time because um, the Red Plumes have another job for you guys. And and um, you have been in and out of consciousness and sobriety for the last two weeks. And now your friends, Angler and Jaunt, have come to tell you that you have another job. And all you remember from them explaining it was that there's a ranger and a wizard who are coming with you. Okay, guys, what, what what's the job? Uh, it's kind of fuzzy for me. Yeah. Uh, right on the board, find a book to the north. Oh, a book? What kind of book? I'm gonna. De details are fuzzy. Hand it to Joe. Uh, Let him explain. Uh, the book uh, belonged to the Antony family who lived in the Antony Manor two days north. But uh, the client is not a member of the Antony family and um, would like to uh, get a hold of it regardless. I don't think we know much more than that. Um, you will be informed as you, uh, as you return to confirm your choices. Um, Captain Leto tells you that um, he has the traditional contract and that he's happy to let you know that you get 20% up front. And he hands Ooh. each one of you a pouch with 50 gold. I needed that. Yes. And Splendid. Then, that's your 20% up front. He says, you come back with that book and you, you, you boys will be very happy. Now, uh, before I disclose any other information, the contracts. And he pulls out his contract book and he hands each one of you a contract. You take your time to read it. And essentially what it sums up is that you will not reveal any information that you discover about the client or about this job in terms of recovering the book to anyone outside of your associates within the red plumes. That discretion is essential. Number two, you will return this book to the red plumes. And then upon conclusion of delivery of the book to the client, you will be paid the rest of the sum. So each one of you will receive 250 gold pieces. Which is a lot of money. Yeah. Like you you guys have have moved up in this and it's you're you're to be honest a little bit suspicious as to why you're getting paid this much. Yeah, if we got fifty for killing like a demon, you know. Not that they knew that there was a demon in there. And you're you're a little bit suspicious, but you know, this, this is some big money talking. So um, your, after you, you guys presumably are willing to sign the contracts or do you have any questions for Captain Leto prior to signing the contracts? Um, Guess I'll just write on the board. Do you know if they left the book in the manner? He says, well, we don't know, but the best the, the last and best known location for this family and the book was in the manner that they moved to decades ago and that they apparently left eight to 10 years ago. Um, he says, with this part of the contract signed off and completed, he's like, this is what the client has told me. 
the Anthony family that um, was in possession of this book that moved out of Flan decades ago, um, bought this manor and all of the lands surrounding it um, north of Flan. And um, that the location of the manor and their lands was uh, due north of Flan, two days journey, um, just at the uh, edge or the tip of Thar. Thar? T-H-A-R, Thar, yes. Um, and that you, you were told that uh, you were given a description actually of what the book looks like as well. Give me one second. Meh. Meh. Why can't I find my... Um, okay. So uh, there's that, sorry. I was looking for something to measure uh, the distance. Yeah, so it's it's about, actually it's not two days journey. It's, it's 40 miles. So it, it's about a day and something. Yeah. So it's, 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 uh, if you go due north until you kind of get to Thar, the area of Thar, um, and then you kind of stay along the western perimeter of Thar as you're going north, that supposedly you will run into this manor and these lands. Um, and that's, that's what you were told roughly is the location. Um, now, you guys are also, well, I don't know how much you would know about Thar. I guess that would be a history check, but we'll get there in a minute. Um, the description for what you're looking for uh, is that this book was, um, it's bound in brown leather. It has silver clasps and silver corners. And on the front cover is a silver floral design. The inside is black ink on parchment. And that's what you're told uh, is what this book is that you're looking for. So um, bound in brown leather, silver corners, silver clasps, and a silver floral design on the front cover. Um, you are also told that there may be other people or at least another person looking for this book as well. And that this competitor or these competitors are not affiliated with the client. In other words, there's more than one party looking for this book. Whether or not they know the location or whether or not they know even what the book looks like is also unknown. But your client being represented by the Red Plumes uh, seems to know of the last location of the Anthony family and of um, the description of the book. So that is the information you are given. Um, this is a sooner the better kind of job because the client has impressed again that there are other parties looking for this book. So it would be in your best interest to hit the road as soon as possible uh, to avoid giving anyone else a leg up. So with that said, um, Captain Leto gives you, like I said, he gives you your, your advanced payment. Um, and he tells you that the other two members of the group should be arriving shortly. Um, he says, just wait for them, you know, get your st supplies ready and wait for them out front of the inn. All right. A wizard would be a good man to have along when it comes to mysterious books. I yes. think we made the right choice. Indeed. Mm. 
And uh, Harley, some ne'er do well stole mutton right off your plate. It was terrible, but we'll never ever know who it was. So let it go. Just <laughs> let it go. Really? Yep. It's just one of those things. <laughs> okay. Is the will of the forlorn? Exactly. Exactly. No, this time it was the Raven Queen. Yeah. I think oh, it was shoot. the work, the oh, work shoot. of the Raven Queen. Shoot. She's punishing me for something. It must be. It must be. So, uh, so how, where have we been staying all this time? Are we staying at the inn or um, camping yeah. outside or? Basically, I'm, I'm, I factored in and, and kind of thought that you guys in the last few weeks have been staying in a shared room just to save money. It has bunk beds. Um, so you, you guys have had like, you know, out of pocket costs of like basically two gold over the course of the last couple of weeks. Each? Uh, no, just total. Like just total. Your, okay. Yeah. So, you know, basically like 20 silver you've you've been you know paying uh paying silver off and and but you're you're fairly you know well known at this point as uh people who work with the red plumes so the the innkeeper is kind of you know giving you the the family pricing so to speak okay so well. and Head to the room and pack up our gear. Before we leave, I'd like to uh, go to like a general store and get more rations. Okay. I did mark it off. I bought 10 and it says 0.5 gold per, so. Okay. Um, I also paid for the rooms. Harley, Harley, do you okay. need to do anything? Well, not in a general store or uh, in the blacksmith, but uh, I would like to go back to the uh, Captain Lido okay. uh, for some personal matter. Okay. So, like, I'll find him probably in the office. Yep. Okay. Oh, ho, 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 ho. I... Uh, flick my top hat to the dance and hey big guy I'm going to the chief again would you let me in he he lets you in okay hello Captain Leto may I disturb you for a while uh, what is it Harley well I probably uh, talked to you about some personal matters and about the people I'm searching for. I'll be more than willing to give up my uh, 50 gold to find out any information about that. So, would you help me? Why, well, maybe, maybe. But see, the problem is that sometimes you find out information and you end up not wanting to know that information. And the thing with uh, me helping you with this sort of thing is, um, if you end up not wanting to know the information, you got to pay me either way, even if the information is unpleasant. It's good to me. I'll think about it. I'll just have to know. Okay, thank you. He nods. If you change your mind, just let me know. Yeah, I'll think about it. Thank you. So um, you guys go down and uh, after doing a couple little bits of shopping, uh, you actually, one important thing, are you... You guys are going to be on foot, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to make sure I knew like if you had horses or if you didn't have horses. So if you were going to buy horses, I need to know that. But if not, that's fine. Well, how much are horses? Uh, 50. 50? 
Okay. okay. We might as well go on foot. Yeah. Not that I can relay this without writing it. Okay. I have a few more items than I did before. <laughs> I pretty much just like my backpack is just like one of those. Got all kind of got a pot hanging off of it. Looks like Brock from Pokemon. Hook. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um so yeah, I loaded loaded for bear. Um I wanted to get that silver cap to put on my uh walking stick. So did did I have a chance to put in an order at the blacksmith? Yes. And what what kind of estimate did they give me for what that would cost? So this the raw silver plus the labor, the craftsmanship for for it to be customized on there is 5 gold pieces. Wow. All right. Well, if I can, if that's ready, I'll yep. uh, pick we're that gonna, up. We're going to say that you did that during the downtime. Excellent. All right. Um, so you guys, you guys are gathered. You, you kind of have all of your stuff. And uh, you see two people who you assume are associates um, because they, they walk up from the outside. They look at the building and then they look at you guys. And, and the one of them uh is a uh elf who is wearing like robes and has like a hooded cape on and he looks out at you guys and and he says uh greetings i am ernest ernest and he bows nice to meet you hail ernest well he, met he says uh and he looks and he, he, he points at Angler and he says, ah, you with the mask. You, you are the one, Den said your name is Angler. Yes. I nod my head. And he, he looks at Jaunt and he says, you, you are the pilgrim, yes? Yes, of the great wandering god far long. And, and... Ah, yes. <laughs> and he, he looks at Harley and he says, and you are, you, I'm uh, a swindler. Yes. Well, there you go. <laughs> yes. There you go. <laughs> Putting it right out there. He says, well, well met. Well met. Yes. And then um, you see the other person looks over and um, this person is, looks human and actually has like light facial hair. And, um, but you notice that his ears are a little bit pointed. And he looks out at you, and he has kind of like shaggy brown hair. Um, he's wearing like leather armor, and he's got like a hooded cape and a backpack. He's got a longbow and a quiver of arrows slung over uh, each of his shoulders, and he's got a dagger in his belt. And he says, uh, how are you? Well met. He says, my name is Tompkins. I'm, I'm the scout. Um, Captain Leto told me where we were going, so if if all of you are ready, we should commence. I would like to make some some distance while we have sunlight. The sooner we'll go there, the better. You're all business, Tompkins. I admire that. Well, uh, I don't really tra like traveling near the Thar at nightfall. So we should get going. Scary things live in the bog. And he, he kind of turns with, with no fanfare whatsoever and starts like walking briskly down the northern path. Um, does, does he have a pet? No, not that. Uh, no. What um, about Murmur? Is Murmur like visible with us all the time? I don't well, know much. Most of, of the, most of the time, he's uh, invisible. He's yeah. oh, okay. visible only when we are alone, probably. He was drunk with Harley. <laughs> slumped on the table uh, basically yes <laughs> um, you guys travel uh, out of Flan and you're heading north um, and you're you're making good time just on foot um, you're it doesn't seem like you're you know like like there's any real worry as you're passing past like the farms around Flan and, and the first um, like 10 miles of your journey are pretty uneventful. Um, and it's getting towards late afternoon 
And uh, Tompkins stops and he, he kind of, uh, he says, he looks around and he says, wait, wait here. He goes, just wait over in that copse of trees. And you see him kind of get off of the road and he begins kind of ducking and moving through like the, the prairie grass and kind of creeping up ahead. Well, keep an eye on him. I'm most, most intrigued by him. He's the ranger, right? Yes. Yeah. I will sneak. And I should say, like, I'm from an isolated, him. I'm from an isolated human community. So, like, being with a changeling and a kanku and an elf and a half, uh, assuming a half elf, like, is a thrill. Yeah. It's like mind blowing for me. But I'm trying to keep, I'm trying to be cool. Yeah. I'm trying to not be all starstruck by you. And you, you guys, are very cool. I'm cool. Oh yes. yeah, I try to be for uh, a human. You see, you see, actually, all of you guys go ahead and make perception checks. Twenty-one. Thirteen. Sixteen. Okay. Um, you see that he is obviously looking at something on the ground. Like he's about, he's about a hundred feet up from you guys, but he's like looking at something and following and then he'll move and look around more and he'll move and look around more. And then you see him kind of pop over the tall grass and just kind of look. And then you see him duck into the tall grass and he, he basically disappears from sight. Like, it looks like he's like crawling somewhere. Well, I yell at him. Major. Uh, Tonkins, what your health I see? You, you see Ernest, the, the wizard, he looks at you and he's like, Oh, shoot! <laughs> um, five minutes go by. And finally, you see Tompkins return. And he comes up and you could see that his his boots are covered in dirt and mud, as are his knees and his pants and his like elbows and shins, like as if he's been crawling. And he, he like kind of comes back up to the road and runs across the road over to where you guys are. And he says, there is an orc camp. We need to be oh. very careful about our next decision." We How many? Try. Well, I saw six that I saw. I saw their footprints. They were on this road at some point, and then they cut off the road and headed east. There's a grove of trees in a rocky area, and they have set up a camp over there. There are about six of them, but there are tents. Looks like they've gone hunting. Um, maybe they're Maybe they're going to stay there for the night, but there's another issue. There's two farmers tied up to trees. They look like they're alive, but they look like they've been beaten up and captured. Now, we could keep going north and just try to move past this area and head towards that manor. Or we could see if there's a way to go over to that camp and maybe free those farmers. I, I don't know. What What do you think? What would be faster? To go through them and kill them at once or go around? Well, we could go around. I, I'm pretty confident that I can lead you guys around. And as long as nobody you know, makes an extremely loud noise, I'm pretty sure that I can lead us far enough around to avoid them. But I don't know how I feel about leaving some poor captured people with six orcs. It just doesn't sit right with me. I'll write on my board that I might be able to try and sneak over and free him. Have I seen an orc? You... Yes. I'm going to say that you have seen orcs before in your early adventures. It's not like they're uncommon in this area. Uh, especially the further out you are from the cities. Um, 
you you have I'll say that you have seen orcs before and you know that they can be pretty pretty vicious. Okay. Well I I'll tell you, friends, I, I don't think I could live with myself knowing that we left a couple of farmers to be perhaps killed. I could live strong. myself any day. <laughs> <laughs> But I think that it may be faster to go through. Go through the orc camp? Well, yeah, you guys orc. know that that this isn't even in the Thar. This is like on the outskirts of the Thar. But the Thar is like a, a kind of a rocky, broken swamp area that stretches for hundreds of miles. And that like there are tribes, whole tribes of orcs and other tribes of nomadic people who live in the Thar. Um, and it's kind of known for being a brutal area. So you you can pretty much guess that if these if these farmers have been captured, that they're either going to be um, traded as slaves to another tribe or brought back to a tribe and turned into slaves or just killed. So whatever fate befalls them, it's not going to be a good one. Those are as good as dead. How uh, far is the camp from where we are? He, he says, well, there are a couple hundred yards north and slightly east off of the road. I, I could lead us there if you guys think that you could be stealthy. Um, I'd, I'll I'd change th in the orc, or at least a short orc. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you use uh, mask of many faces. Well, uh, I'm not sure about how my how my uh, racial. Uh, oh works, no, you're using but... your racial ability. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. It totally e immediately works. Um, Jaunt, you and Aranes and Tompkins and Angler. Uh, for all of you guys, like, what is your discuss your your plan? Um, because Tompkins can lead you guys up there if you guys wanted to all kind of go and try to stealth or if you wanted to split up or if you wanted, you know, um, to create like a distraction so Angler could try to get in there. What, what are you guys thinking in terms of your strategy? I was thinking that they could stay off somewhere hidden and I could try and sneak the farmers away okay and if push comes to shove they just jump into combat okay man you are not going alone save me you are not going alone i'll just, I'll just nod at me he can he can come along or harley he looks like uh -huh. an orc okay well an orc with a top hat remember do you, that <laughs> do you want uh John, what are your thoughts on what you would do? Uh, seems like my plan would be for um, uh, pumpkins to get us as close as possible without, you know, be there, especially if we can observe them and maybe, you know, have a the next sort of team be um, uh, uh, Harlan Angler you know, Anglin and then I don't know if Har if you could just infiltrate like under in the camp uh, as the orc, I don't know. I'm new to this kind of uh espionage. Uh, but, trust, um, me. trust me, I'm um, probably a distraction. They okay. won't bite for long. Maybe a couple of do you, rounds. Do you speak their tongue? Not at all, man. I may try under common, but it won't work if they don't know. Okay. Well, um, this seems like, I mean, as long as they don't know there, we have the advantage. We know where they are. Yep. So. You, you do indeed. I, um, so, I mean, Tompkins can get you... Tompkins can get all of you guys up close enough so that you could at least kind of hear and see sort of what's going on. And then if Angler wants to give it a go to stealth up, 
um, you could you could try doing that. So I'm going to say that we're going to do a group stealth. So everybody roll a stealth check and tell me what your results are. And I'm going to average them out. Mm. 11. Six. 11. Um, sorry, what was your stealth roll, John? Six. six. Sorry, it was drinking six. Okay. And uh, Ernest the wizard also got six. Uh, Tompkins, even with his 17. So. so uh, 10 or 11 seems to be quite right. <laughs> yeah. So, so basically, you're, you guys are, you're not unstealthy, but you're kind of just walking. Uh, on the gravel road. You you get off the road, you go through this muddy area and you see some trees up ahead. And he's like, you know, Tompkins is kind of like crouched down and leading you towards the trees. And, you know, you guys get into the trees and you can actually at this point smell the cooking meat that he had described. Um, you don't hear any voices yet, but as you kind of progress through this uh, this patch of woods, um, trying to be as quiet as you can, you get to a certain point where you can start to hear voices and they are speaking in Orcish. So if you speak Orc, um, you, you can actually understand them. Anybody um, speak Orc? No. So Tom, Tompkins, he's, he like kind of crouches down near you guys and he's speaking to Angler and he says, if you go straight that way, there's a, a clearing in the trees. They have a fire in the middle of the clearing and they're roasting meat and there's a, a bunch of them sitting around. There are two tents and then you'll see there's trees off to the left where you see the farmers tied up. He goes, I don't know if you want to try to stealth around and get to those trees without them seeing you or not. He goes, but we'll wait here if we hear them or you need help, just make some kind of noise and, and we'll come in. And he has his bow ready. I will start to go. It is up to Harley if he wants to join. Uh, how far escort. we are? So you, you guys are just under 60 feet. I will, I'll say you're 50 feet away from... Um, their, their fire from kind of the no sorry from the the edge of the clearing okay i got you covered okay so uh angler yours are you stealthing trying to stealth over towards the prisoners then yes okay make me a uh, stealth check 25 nice one. 18 plus um, seven you you get up to the tree line, you kind of, you know, get, get over to the left and you're, you're near the edge of the clearing. Um, you could see now, you could see the two tents uh, that are kind of on either side of the big fire in the middle. And you could see that there are about five orcs. You, you kind of count five orcs sitting around this fire. Um, one of them is kind of turning the spit and you see some kind of animal that looks like maybe it's a, a boar um, roasting on the spit. And he's, you know, slowly turning it. The rest of the orcs are like drinking from these wooden mugs and talking in orcish. Um, you do not see the sixth orc. Uh, but you do see 10 feet away from you. There are two trees right next to each other. And you see these two human farmers who are tied up and they're slumped over at the base of the trees and they are tied up with rope to the trees. That's, Do they look unconscious? They, they look like they're unconscious or asleep. You're not sure. Um, they, you do see bruising. You see like they're bruised and scraped up in a few places like they got beat up. Um, smash cut back to Harley. Harley, 
what are you doing? You're with the group right now. What are you doing? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'll send invisible murmur flying into the camp to scout what's there and look for the sixth orc. All right. You send murmur into the camp. You see five orcs, as I described, around the fire. Um, the sixth orc is not out in the open. Um, murmur, I will make a stealth check. Because invisible or not, Murmur would have to go into the two tents to check. But successfully, weaseling into uh, the two tents, Murmur finds the sixth orc sleeping in one of the two tents. Okay. I'll just prepare a reaction. Um, so I don't know okay. if, if I may, like prepare Eldritch Blast to shoot anyone that may see okay. Angler. Um, John, what do you have? Are you just, you, do you just have your staff kind of at the ready? Yeah, and I'm thinking real hard about uh, casting um, spiritual weapon if, if, any, if anything starts to go down. Okay. So I haven't successfully used it yet, so I'm sitting there going, uh, saying my in inward prayers and and tactics. Okay. Um, Angler, you have an opportunity to sneak up to one of the trees. Um, what's your plan? I will sneak up to the tree and first of all, see if they're awake. Okay. If they're awake, I will uh, put my hand in the mask and a shush type gesture okay so make the I, i'm not going to make you make the stealth check but you can get up to the tree you see that neither one of them are awake you do see them breathing but it seems like they're unconscious all right take my water skin and squirt some water on their face okay or at least one of them one so of them wakes them up one of them kind of looks up and looks around. Just, <laughs> just tell him to shush. Okay, yeah, that would be horrifying. You yes. would be horrifying to see. Uh, yes, it here's, would. Here's what I'm going to Worse than the orcs. orcs. <laughs> this is a non-verbal persuasion check. You're basically trying to convince through your gesture for them not to flip out. Okay. So make your non-verbal persuasion check. I'm going to have this person make an insight check to see if they can assess that you are not, in fact, a demon or a threat. Yeah, death <laughs> coming for your soul. Dirty 20. All right. Well, that's good. So uh, they, they got over a 10. So you, you kind of, you're like, and, and the person's like, Do I have to make like an attack roll to hit the ropes or? Uh, no, just... but you do need to make another stealth check. That I can do. 17. Okay. You manage to cut the rope. The person is no longer bound. They, you see them kind of like look to you, like look around the corner because you're kind of behind the tree. And then they kind of like look back towards the, the fire and the orcs. And then they look back to you. Which way is the uh, group, our group? Back. So if you, back. if this person got up, they would have to make a stealth check to get back behind the tree line. I will try and usher them to the group. May I assist them by uh, using Murmur? to, I don't know, maybe snap some twig uh, on the opposite side of the camp. Um, you could. So I, so I do that. Okay. Hope Armor uh, doesn't die. So you're going to assist. All right. So Angler, you're going to assist the, the basically by trying to usher you're going to assist the um, farmer in getting up from the tree. Yes. So that's going to give them 
advantage uh, versus the orc's perception. Okay, so you you kind of you're like, and you kind of like take their arm and guide them, and they get up quickly and quietly and kind of come around the tree, and then you bring them into the woods and kind of follow yourself your your own path back towards the group. Uh, the rest of you guys see. Yes, the rest of you guys see because it's still dim light as the evening's coming, but you can still see. Um, you see a very fatigued and bruised farmer coming along with Angler. And they make it back to you guys. And, and the farmer's like, please, can you, can you get my cousin? Can you save him? I'm going to go try and make the trip back over there. Okay. Uh, start tending to the, uh, the wound, you know, the injuries of the farmer. Make a medicine check for me. Uh, 10. Okay. Die. So you, yeah, I mean, basically, you, you know, you, you kind of, you like assess his worst cuts and scrapes and you, you take a little like poultice and you wipe it on his, you know, his wounds, you kind of clean his wounds and put a little thing there and, you know, help bandage him up a little bit. Um, all right. Back to you, Angler. You're making a stealth check to get back to the second All right. Okay. Go ahead with that. Hmm. 14. Okay, you you make it. So you are behind the second tree. That person is still unconscious. The man seems to be about the same age as the other man that you rescued. I didn't get like a name from the other guy, right? No. Like his name or the... Okay. Okay, I will... Splash the water skin on his face. Meanwhile, may I do something <clears> for the <throat> farmer I imagined I may have been able to do? Well, uh, due, to the pack of due to the pact of chain, uh, I can speak through my familiar, can't I? Um, I, I think I can. Yeah. I'm not sure. You have voice so, of the Queen Master? So, voice of the Chain Master, I have that. And uh, okay. I'll try to alert the, the second villager or the peasant. Uh, to the presence of the savior. Okay. Beforehand. Okay. Um, Angler, you, um, you can get to this person. You you kind of peek around the tree, and you see that they're they're kind of like, like awake. And they're they're like looking over by the tree where their cousin was, and then they they see you. I'm gonna do pretty much the same thing, except like point to the rope, the cut ropes, with the knife in my hand. Just be like, okay, make a um, stealth check. Ooh nine okay um you are in the middle of cutting the ropes and one of the orcs from the fire gets up and he's loosening his his belt and lowering his pants and he's walking oh. over to the prisoner and he seems a little drunk and he starts urinating near the prisoner and then he looks 
and sees the prisoner and he looks at the other tree where there's no prisoner and then he looks back and he's like oh and then he le like leans forward around the tree and sees you initiative Time to roll initiative. Everybody, everybody. roll. Yes. Everybody roll. Five. Five. Fifteen. Fifteen for Jaunt. Five for Angler. What about Harley? Thirteen. But I go get my own dice. All right. Uh, let's see. Tompkins in the clutch move with a 22. Thank God for Tompkins and his enormous dexterity and observational miss. Um, the orcs. Oof. Not Oof. Uh, orcs at 18. Ernas is at 12. Um, and then the two rescuees. Let me roll for them. Oh, four. That's not good. Um, that's after Angler. And then before Angler at nine, we have Carol. All right. So, um, Angler, you are catching this guy off guard. So before we, we engage in initiative, you have one, one surprise action that you can do. You already have your dagger out because you were using it to cut the ropes. This orc is literally standing in front of you with his wiener in his hand and no weapon, and he's drunk. So what do you do? If I throw the knife, does that count as proficient, or is that? Yeah. OK, I'm going to throw the dagger. All right, make a throw and attack roll. So dex plus proficiency bonus. Tell me what the total is. Uh, 20, 30, 20. Uh, that's a hit. Roll damage. That is D4 plus... D4 plus your dex bonus, yes. And if it's a surprise round, would that be sneak attack too? Yes. I think that's 2D6. Yes. That is a total of... Nine. Oh, you, you whip the dagger up and it hits him like in the chest and he's like, Argh! and he's, he is in pain. Like you hit like a major artery and it's just blood starts gushing out. He sh blood shoots out of his mouth Argh! and he falls back. Um, up next, I feel like he has one health left. Up next are them. Them orcs. So, and more four orcs. orcs, four orcs sitting around a fire, hear their friend yell, ah, and jump up and start grabbing at their weapons. And they're like looking around, they're like, what's going on? They're not seeing anything in common. It's all in orcish. And they start running over in that direction. Um, one orc in a tent. Let me see. He was sleeping. He is still asleep because I rolled a one. Nice. Uh, he, is, he is passed out in a tent. All right. Uh, let's see. Of the orcs that got up to run over there, literally only one sees and figures out what's going on. He made his perception check. He will attack you. And a total of 12. What's your armor class? 14. He misses. He swings down with his crappy short sword and slices through the air right near you. Um, Jaunt, you are up. You you see this kerfuffle happening. Like you you're kind of like watching from afar. You see the firelight, the dusk, you know, the light of dusk still illuminating enough for you to see this. And you hear like, Ugh! 
and you see the, the orcs getting up and they're starting to run over towards the area where you know uh, Angler and the other prisoner to be, what do you do? Uh, I'm going to target the, the not the, the guy who just swung at um, Angler, but the next orc on his way, if I can see that well, yes. and uh, hit him with the sacred flame. What's the old the sacred flame of daybreak? Sorry. What's range on sacred flame? Uh, sixty feet. Okay, that'll make it. Um, make I don't have to roll for that. Yeah, what's your uh spell save DC? He he needs to make a deck save against it. Thirteen. He makes because I amazingly even even with a minus. One, he has an, yeah, I rolled an 18. Um, so he takes no damage or half damage? He takes none. All right. I just got an idea. Okay. Um, and then for move. my, can, can I do my bonus action? Yes, you have a bonus action and a move. Uh, bonus action to, um, I'll do spiritual weapon. Okay. And and uh, by the stomp of the righteous boots, and then have a big old fist appear, and I can attack with it, right? In this this uh, yes. right away. When you, when you cast it, you can make a spell attack. Now, technically, I would say no because you already cast a spell this round. But so that was a cantrip, though. It doesn't matter. Does it matter? Oh, yeah. Okay. So the bonus, you, you could, in, in other words, like in a fresh, clean round, you could go spiritual weapon as a bonus action and then spell attack with it that same round. Okay. If you did sacred flame, which is a spell attack action, you can create the spiritual weapon this round, and then next round you can rock with that. Now, if I had made a melee attack, could I then do this, uh, do the spiritual weapon and if attack? If you made a melee attack, you could activate yeah the spiritual weapon but you cannot have it also attack okay so basically spiritual weapon is like having being able to stay out of melee but using your spiritual weapon acting like you're in melee okay in the sense that like you have a weapon that could be 60 feet away from you or you know 50 feet and have it attack things and move it around to attack things because you can move it with a bonus action and attack with it with an action. Okay. So so I, I summoned it a fist there, but I'm not... That'll be it for this round? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, Harley, you are up. Okay. I'll probably uh, run um, 30 feet towards the camp. Okay. Then I'll use my um, misty step as the bonus action to teleport behind one of the orcs. And then I'll stab him in the gut, point blank. Okay. So. <sighs> Oh shoot! I have natural one on attack. You you move. You using the shadows. You whoop whoop, and you reappear behind one of the orcs, which would have been so clutch because then you could have attacked him, and then your friend Angler could have used that flanking bonus to get his sneak attack in. But you swing out, and the orc doesn't even see you, but he's he's drunk and he just kind of like wavers just out of the way. It's just total. Total luck. Um, and that brings us to Ernas, who also moves, who runs a bit closer, about 30 feet closer so that he can see through the, the woods more. And then he reaches his hand out and shooting out of his hand comes this bolt of fire, also known as a fire bolt. No way. Shoo. Oh, you're not going to believe this. So I have to move my camera and show you what it looks like. Oh, it's not going to show the screen. Damn it. It looked like not 20. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly what it is. thought you were going to be like, it's a one you hit angler. 
That's badass. Look at that. There it is. There it is. Oh, nice. Shazam. So. Oh, he's in the woods now. Yeah. Well, this is much better anyway, right? It is. So, um, he he gets lucky. I mean, that's there's no doubt about it. But that firebolt tears into one of the orcs, and the orc is blasted five feet back from the from the intensity of flame, and it's it is enveloped in flame, enveloped in flame, and that orc is dead. D e a d dead. Um, that's about all that a wizard can do. So uh, next up is the farmer that you rescued. <laughs> he's he's like cousin, I'm coming, and he grabs a stick and he's running up, and that's all. He 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 runs up. He's kind of on his way up. Good for him. Uh, Admirable. Uh, angler, you you have uh, a couple things going on. Uh, namely the orcs that are swarming you and the remaining still tied up guy. Um, and you also don't have a weapon at the ready. So what do you do? I pull the rapier out and try and slash the ropes. Sure. You, you could do that. That's Go an action. Make an attack, and make an an attack, attack okay. against the ropes. It's, it's, you, you, as long as you hit a 10, you're fine. You hear that ding? That is a seven. Total? Yes. You hack plus five. You quickly pull out your rapier and you hack at the, the rope and you don't hack through it. You hit it, but it's sturdy, thick rope. Good mm. rope. Meanwhile, he will struggle. I'm going to make a strength check to break the rope. Despite his struggle, he is not able to, to get out of the rope, which brings us back full circle to Tompkins who moves forward again and fires an arrow, which shoots off uh, just over the heads of the orcs. And he's, you hear him curse under his breath in Elvish. For those of you who speak Elvish, he's like, damn it. <laughs> damn it. Um, I'm laughing quietly. <laughs> the orcs um, continue their onslaught. One of them is going to slash straight out at the poor cousin who's tied up and hits, doing me four damage not enough to kill him but he's definitely in pain and ouch um angler another one swings out for uh 15 uh, your armor class is 14 so that's a hit uh and you will take four also miss and uh you hear some some something moving in the tent. Like, oh no, we woke up. Yeah. So he, he made his perception check and he's like, um, this brings us then back to Jaunt. Jaunt, you were up. Your spiritual weapon floats. The fist of Farklagen is ready <laughs> to smash. So I just want to verify. I'm totally thick on this. I don't know why I can't grasp this thing, but because it's it is a bonus action, right? So I can I do some other kind of attack and attack with that, or is is so is this you, just my so casting time is a bonus action? Okay. So that means you can make it. Now there are a lot of spells that are like this. So for example, the druids have shillelagh. That's a bonus action to cast. So you could be like, shalele, and then your stick now is imbued with magical shalele power, and then you attack for your action with your shalele okay. stick. In your case with spiritual weapon, you're doing spiritual weapon, and bloop, the fist or whatever you imagine it looking like appears. Then using it to attack is an action. So that is called okay. a melee spell attack. So you have it appear 60 feet away, and then you have it make a melee spell attack. That is your your bonus action and your attack in that round. Okay. So you created it last round. Now this round, you can attack with it. Okay. You could still I'm gonna run. If you have another bonus action, you could do a different bonus action 
and have the spiritual weapon attack. Do you understand what I mean? Okay. Yeah. Sacred flame, for example, is not a bonus action. You could not, it's a cantrip, but it's not a bonus action. It takes your full spell attack. All right. Then I'm going to run about half the distance and run about, well, I guess that's my full speed. We're 60 feet. So yeah, I'll run my, my full uh, speed, to get a little closer about halfway, and then I'll hit that same orc I was targeting before with the spiritual weapon. So Okay, so you're making the melee spell attack with the spiritual weapon. So in this case, yeah. you're, you're, you're using your spell attack, right? So that's your wisdom and your proficiency bonus added to your role. You got that? Yeah. Okay, so go ahead and make your roll, and then you're going to add that that total uh, that spell attack bonus total. Eight, um, uh, 13. That's a hit. So now you're going to roll the damage. So it's a D8 plus your wisdom modifier is your damage. Uh, five. Okay. Right. You do yeah. a nice hearty five force damage. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, eight would have been eight. Okay. Oh, so you didn't add it in. Yeah. All right. So you hit it hard. And this thing is like, oh, and like, it's not dead, but it's, you just like walloped this thing. Um, now, as an example, you, you don't need to move it, but you could use your bonus action to move it. So if we were playing on a map and there was like another bad guy, but he wasn't right there, he was like 20 feet away. You could use your bonus action this round to move the spiritual weapon over there and then next round be able to attack with it. Savvy? Well, yeah. Well, since I did so, I did a good amount of damage on him. Uh, maybe I'll move it to the, has the guy come out of the tent yet or is there just movement in the tent? He's coming out next round. So you, you right. see, like the tent rocking back and forth and you hear somebody grumbling in there. But currently gonna... the majority of the threats are all swarming Farmer number two and angler. Okay. All right. Well, I'll keep my fist where it is. Then. Okay. Um, yeah. Harley, you are up. You're in the thick of it. Um, okay. Um, first of all, I would like to blast the, the orc I attacked uh, with Eldritch Blast. So, shatter! Um, you're, you, you teleported behind yep. York. So you're, you're, you're within range. If you cast this spell, he, he's going to get to attack you. So, okay. Even, okay. So I'll attack him. With your rapier? Yeah. With okay. my short sword. Or short sword, I mean. Yeah. Okay. It's, okay. Nine. That's a, uh, <laughs> that's a miss. And uh, as the bonus action, I would like to tell Murmur to attack one of the guys also. Um, <laughs> I rolled a 19. Murmur succeeds in attacking one of the guys. Okay. Um, roll a D6 and tell me what the result is. This is just going to be randomly determined one, which one. guy. Okay, that is the first guy who has a dagger sticking out of his uh, clavicle, and Murmur attacks him, and that is enough, just enough to drop him, uh, thanks to the the dagger that uh, Angler originally threw. So you successfully drop another. Um, okay, up next is Ernas, the wizard. He moves around for a better vantage point, fires a firebolt, and it misses. Rip. Um, cousin runs up, breaks through the tree line and swings his stick, <laughs> missing, just, just has all the heart and none of the skill. Just, ha ha cousin, I'm coming. And he swings and misses. Um, angler, you are up. I'm going to disengage. Okay. I was going to say there, there are still one, two, three of the orcs that are in between you, the prisoner, and Harley in that area. 
Well, I'm going to disengage okay. and circle to the one that was attacking the cousin. And I'm going to swing on him. Okay. With my rapier. You do not get a flanking bonus from this. I know. I know. Okay. All right. So you, you go ahead, you move around the tree and you come around the other side, kind of surprising him, and you lunge out with your rapier. That is 18 to hit. That's a hit. What's damage? I will also use my first psionic blade of the day. That is 1d4 plus 3 extra. Okay. Uh, 11 total. 11. You stab forth killing another drunk orc skewering him through the ribs and he drops uh this brings us to <laughs> the still tied up other prisoner who struggles in vain, uh, in vain. Top, top of the order Tompkins moves up 10 feet grabs another arrow from his quiver pulls back and fires Oh, missing again. Tom Gens. Um, <laughs> this brings us to the orcs. Orc number one, well, actually, this would be orc number three, is not happy at having taken damage and will reach out and stab uh, at Harley, uh, hitting armor class 16. Yes? Okay, it hits. Okay. Um, may, I, may I use the reaction? You may. I will use Hellish Rebuke. Oh, Hellish Rebuke. All right. Um, let's see. Let's see. I didn't know you had that. Okay. So you're you're going to take the the damage. So you you take four or more. And okay. he, he has to make a deck save against your spell save DC. What is your spell save DC? Uh, 13. Which he fails radically. And now you will um, invoke 2d10 fire damage upon him. Okay. Which would be quite. I couldn't. Okay, it's uh, 13. Oh, yes. He burns up. Uh, so he hits, <laughs> he hits you, and you're like, and, and he's like, Aah! and just becomes covered in flames. Uh, Angler, okay, you actually, all of you guys see this, and it is terrifying. Like, you, you, you see this, like, it's almost like his own sword hitting Harley caused him to just burn up and, and his flaming body falls to the ground. Um, this brings us to Ernas, who will also actually hit, uh, doing meh, 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 not quite enough, five damage, but still pretty good against orc number five. Um, the cousin, the the he is actually going to grab the dagger out of the dead orc and start cutting the ropes of his cousin uh, in an effort to free his cousin, which brings us to Angler. Are there any orcs near them? Yes, there's one left. There's one left that just got hit by a firebolt uh, that kind of glanced off of his shoulder. Um, but he's still very much near you and the prisoners and Harley. And you see another one emerging from the tent coming over towards you guys. I will lunge at the one near me. Okay. Natural 20. Oh, snap. For 25. Um, I'd say for the, race, the stake of remedy, he is very dead. Yeah, for, for the rapier, um, 
he is he is quite dead. Uh, you put a finishing blow on him, and so it's like he gets spun to one side by the firebolt from Ernas. And then, what does it look like when you come around the other side with your rapier? Like a blur. I come up. I stab him like right through the eye, and then just like slam him down. He he drops in a in a crumple. Um, this brings us to the top of the order. There is one orc who has come out of the tent. Uh, he is wearing a loincloth. He has no armor on, but he does have an axe. Tompkins misses him. Uh, Tompkins. The orc. Ooh, somebody might suffer. That is a 17 to hit. Um, 17. Harley, does that hit? Yep. Okay, and you take eight damage. Oh, okay. Um, this brings us to uh, John. I'm going to hit that uh, orc with the fist, the spiritual okay. fist. Uh, 18. That's a hit. Damage? Uh, seven. And, and you added in your wisdom bonus to that? Yeah, I actually added it in too much last time. So okay. um, you hit him again, and it's it kind of knocks him off balance. Definitely doing some damage. Um, this brings us then after jaunt to Harley. Uh, how many hit points do you have left? Well, okay. So you you see this lumbering orc in a loincloth with an axe, who is just you know full on like raging at the fact that you guys have slaughtered his his uh comrades how far he is he's right next to you like like right next to you he just okay, whacked so you eldritch blast is out of the question right so i'll attack him oh no 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 no, no. i have to uh, okay, I have to attack him with my short sword, and it's uh, 15. That's a hit. Okay, let's see. Seven. He is dead. <laughs> you stab him with your short sword through the gut, and he drops. And I yell, Ferd, what? Ferd. Uh -huh. Nice. So, so you guys uh, have this moment after after this orc drops, where there's a very th this this moment of silence where all you hear are the two cousins talking to each other, and they're like, "Oh, thank thank the goddess, Shantae is good. We we've, we've been saved." Uh, uh, just for the record. I'm still looking as an orc. Okay. Oh, um, that does make a difference. Hold on. But he does have a top hat. I have a top hat. Very yeah. fancy orc. So the one that's tied up is like, cousin, hurry, there's still one more. Um, John, you, you see that all of the orcs seem to be dead. Um, and you, Tompkins, and Ernest kind of come into the clearing. Uh, it is that moment of silence at the end of the combat where all you hear is the sizzling orc meat, uh, as well as the sizzling of the boar that they were roasting because no one's turning it anymore. Um, and other than that, it's very quiet in this patch of woods. So, um, John, what would you like to do? Um, go tend to the cousins and see if they need any healing. Okay. I, does, if, if, if anybody needs healing, give me a holler. But, uh, well, maybe uh, Harley, he sounds like you might need some. You see that both, both Harley and Angler seem to have taken uh, a couple hits during the combat. Yeah, 
Don't worry about what? me, man. I'll be okay. After a short rest. Um, as you say that, Tompkins is like, yeah, we're not resting here. Sorry. If you guys want to scour this place for anything useful, that's fine. But we, we got to get a move on. He's like, I don't want to be this close to Thar. It's it's dangerous. We, we got to head up the road a bit more before nightfall. I'll check the boar and off we go. Okay, John. Um, sorry, uh, Angler, is there... Anything that that you want or need? Do you do you need healing? Do you? No, I don't need healing. But I'm just picking up the. Do the axes <laughs> look like they would sell for anything? So, if you guys want to take a few minutes to to kind of search, um, other than the obvious things, I can tell you what you're able to recover. Go ahead and make okay. investigation rolls if you want to search the camp. Twenty, natural twenty. Okay. I'll give it to you because I only got a five. I got a five. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It so, was almost right. really good. You guys that got the fives, I'm going to tell you what's on the orcs because that's that you don't really have to search too hard for. It, okay. So there are four short swords and two battle axes. Um, there are five sets of padded armor that they were wearing. There are two shields. Um, John, as you are searching through the tents, you come across um, the book. The, <laughs> the following <laughs> thing: um, you come across uh, what looks like some things that they maybe have looted from people. Um, you find a a pouch with a hundred copper pieces. You find a azurite. Uh, like a gem. Um, you find a holy symbol, not of your god, but actually what looks like a holy symbol to the goddess of Shant Shantae. That's C-H-U-N-T-E-A. Um, and this looks like it's made out of gold, like it's actually worth something. Um, you also find a small potion, but it is not labored. It has a purplish liquid in it. Good thing we got a wizard. Well, I would assume that uh, maybe a lot of this stuff might belong to the cousins. So uh... you you don't know, perhaps. I would like well, to get my knife back. Um, you can do that. And actually, you see Tompkins is in the process of trying to carefully recover his arrows. Um, so, John, you come out of the tents and, you know, having found some of these things, uh, you see that the, the two cousins are now free from their ropes and um, they they're kind of looking at you guys and, and the, the first cousin that you rescued uh, looks down and he, he, he bows to uh, Angler and then he looks at the rest of the group and he's like, many thanks for rescuing my cousin and I. We were, we were attacked. Our families uh, share farmlands to the west and uh, these orcs, their raids have been more and more frequent and more bold recently much, much more so than in past seasons when we were growing up and we were out repairing the, the, the far fence to keep our livestock in the fields when they, they set upon us. Did they uh, take any of your items, your equipment, your... Uh, well, we, we just had special? some tools when we were fixing the fence, but it, they didn't seem interested in any of those things. They, they just captured us. And, and the other cousins, like, I've heard that they, they capture folk and sell them as slaves. And the other cousin nods. Uh, well, I'm afraid be, that would have been your fate. If, if you'd be kind enough to, to help, get, help us get back to our farmstead, we, we would be honored to, to host you tonight. There, 
you could sleep in the barn, we'll, we'll feed you food. Our families would be very grateful. Well, as I'm looking as an orc, I lean to them and run, little chicken. It's going dark. Run. <laughs> they I'm, I'm trying to intimidate him. Okay. Make the intimidation check. The one cousin looks at you and then he looks at the 16. rest of the guys and, and he's like, is, is this, I thought this orc was with you, that he was like one of your friends. I saw him attack the other orcs. <laughs> yes. Um, he's a, he's a good orc. Mm, strange. Well, I'm a special. <laughs> He's a special orc. Huh. Um, well, so be well, it. I want to. I'm going to pull uh, uh, Harley off to the side and be like, "I don't know if we want to really blow our uh, accommodations for the evening. I mean, they they offered us hospitality." Tompkins says, "I would much prefer spending the night in a barn on a farmstead than out on the road near the Thar. This would be wise." Okay, as you wish. And I change my appearance into the uh, one of the villagers or the peasants <laughs> we saved. Okay, they they look and they're like, oh, "What source of sorcery is this? An orc who could change faces?" And then they kind of mutter to each other and and they're they're like, "We should go." And Tompkins is like, "Yes, come." And you guys follow uh, back kind of out of this way to the west. And eventually you get back to the main road um, where the, the two cousins are like, yes, if we, we live that way. And they kind of point the way. You guys follow them back. And a, a few miles west of the road, a bit closer to the river, you guys come to this farmstead. And it's, it's not huge. Uh, there's like a, a pair of cottages that are about, a hundred yards apart. Um, and then there's like two barns that are kind of shared between the two cottages. And you see just, you know, acres and acres of crops. Um, and the one cousin says, he, he's like, please come. Uh, and you, you go to one of the cottages and you see there's like flickering lights inside and, and uh, there's a knock on the door and, and the door is opened by an older woman and she looks out and she's like, uh, Karov, you're, you're alive. You're safe. We were so worried when you and your cousin Sem didn't return. And, and Karov says like, yes, mother, we were, we were set upon by a group of orcs and, and these travelers, they, they saved us. And she's like, well, come in, come in. You are most welcome. Come. And you, you go inside this humble cottage um, and, and the woman kind of looks, looks at your group a little bit suspiciously, uh, as it would fit somebody who doesn't kind of, you know, see folks from the city. Um, and, and she kind of looks at Karov and says, and he leans in and he says, mother, some of them are strange, but they're good folk and they rescued us. And that one with the mask saved me and cousin, we were tied up and and, and she's like, oh, thank, thank the goddess that you're here. And she looks at all of you and she says, come sit. And um, John, are you wearing any holy symbol of Farlangan? Yeah, I have my amulet around my neck. She, she actually looks at it closer and she says, are, are you a priest of the pilgrim? I, and I take my hat off and bow to her. That I am, good lady. She's well like, met. Oh, your 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 God is most appreciated. Your your you are welcome in our home. Come, uh, please sit uh, around the table. I I have just finished making a stew, and she she goes over to her little kitchen area and pulls out a ladle and begins kind of ladling out this stew into these wooden bowls and brings them over to you guys and the. Again, it's very, you know, very, very kind of 
um, meager accommodations, but the, the food is good uh, and, and seems to be kind of mixed with a bunch of different vegetables. And there's kind of some barley to, to fill it up, but it has a good, strong smell. And, and um, she says, I, I am very grateful that you were able to rescue my son and, and my nephew. They're the, the, the most able-bodied men that we have now that my, my husband's been gone for several years. Um, my, my sister-in-law lives in the other cottage and their children are younger and uh, Sam is her oldest son. So we would be, I don't know where we would be. We certainly wouldn't be able to work the land if it hadn't been for, for the boys. But she's like, we're most grateful to you. You guys enjoy your meal. Um, she actually brings out, uh, as you guys kind of finish the stew, um, she, she brings out this, this big, uh, a, about, you know, a, a two foot tall cask and sets it on the table. And she's like, I, I have some mead if you would like this. We make the mead here ourselves. We, we keep these uh, behind the cottage in the nice weather, they, they actually produce quite a bit of honey. And she, she offers you guys mead. And she gets these little, these little um, glasses that are, that are, looks like they're like homemade ceramic cups. You know, the, the, you could see that they're, they're hand thrown uh, and she kind of sets the cups out and pours these little cups of mead. And there's enough for everybody to have like a couple, couple cups. I'll change into random woman I saw in the past. Thank you, my dear. It's most appreciated. She seems uh, to be ill at ease with your shape changing, as to as do the other two. But they they're polite and in their rural sensibilities, and they're like, "You're most welcome." And they they kind of like look at each other and. Um, the older cousin, you know, he, he, after you guys have dinner and, and you're having some drinks, he, he says, um, let me, let me get some blankets for you. Uh, just give me a few moments. And he, he goes up a ladder and there's kind of like a sleeping loft, uh, at the top of the cottage and he comes down with some blankets and, 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 um, he takes a lantern and he says, uh, come my friends, follow me. I, I will take you to, to the barn. And he, he takes you out to the barn and uh, it's a it's in decent shape and you see bales of hay. Uh, you see there there are horses in about three of the eight stalls and they they look not like riding horses like these these look like pack horses um, and you see like a plow and you see some other kind of tools and farm implements um, and and he he hangs the the lantern on a, a post a peg coming out of a post and he hands you guys blankets and he's like, uh, thank you. And, and once again, for, for saving my cousin and I, and, uh, you are most welcome to stay the night. And, and if you would like, we'll have breakfast in the morning. I, I'll take the blanket and won't you suffer by cold. If we take this. Oh no, we, we will, we'll be fine. It, it's the least we can do. And, and it, I don't think it's going to be too cold tonight. So, um, okay. You are most Thanks. Welcome. Please sleep. And, and Thanks. And I'm sorry for the theater. Oh, uh, no, no problem. It's just that we, we've never seen magic like this before, but, um, you are certainly powerful folk. And we, we are just thankful for the gods that you happen to be passing our way. And, and um, uh, may the blessings be be upon you. And he he bows twice, and he and upon goes. you, my friend. And and you guys, uh, you guys kind of set up your your bedding uh, using some of the hay, and uh, you lay out your bed rolls, and and the the blankets help to just kind of give you a little more extra comfort. And um, you get a good night's sleep. Everybody gains the benefits of a long rest. Those of you who were among the wounded, you, you feel uh, better after some rest. Um, in the morning, Jaunt, you, you awaken 
very familiar with this rural life to, lifestyle, you awaken to the sound uh, of a rooster somewhere on the farm property. Um, you go outside, it's kind of crisp air, but there's that fresh morning air and the sun's creeping up over the farm. There's still dew on the ground. And you just, you just realize how amazingly blessed you are by the power of the pilgrim. Um, and you, you kind of look out at the farm now in the morning sight and you, you see already family members bustling about. Uh, you see kids at the, the adjacent farm where the cousin is. Uh, they're out like milking cows. Um, you, you see uh, another woman with a couple other kids um, kind of by a chicken coop and it looks like they're maybe gathering eggs and there they're, it seems like life has already started and it's early in the morning do i see the old woman at all is she up, up yeah and around? you see her she's actually um she's gathering there there's a stone well and you see her um cranking up the uh bucket and you see fresh water splashing and she takes the bucket off and she sees you and she's like oh good morning pilgrim uh I, I'm not sure if your friends are still sleeping, but I, I'll be making breakfast for all of you. If you, I have oats and, and we'll have some eggs. And uh, I, I, I don't believe we have any ham, but, uh, but, but I'll, I'll fix something for you all. Well, madam, we are most obliged for your hospitality. And I believe that, and I'm, and I'm moved by your familiarity with, with my God. It's, it's all too rare in these, these parts, but I, I have something for you. And I press the uh, the gold uh, medallion of Chante into her palm, and I believe the great eternal pilgrim guided us so that we may put this amulet back in the hands of the faithful. She's like, I I, I don't know what to say. This is this is far too valuable. Your your generosity exceeds anything that we we could provide. I I, I thank you. It's thank you. Your faith and your hospitality, that is of a greater value that cannot be repaid. She says, please, when you are ready, come, come into the house. I will have breakfast ready for all of you. And she, she smiles. And you see, as she's walking up to the farmhouse, two of the posts that support the, the front porch of the cottage, you see there's a stone depiction of the goddess of Shantea. It's very primitive looking. And you see she, she sets the bucket of water down. And she, she takes the stone depiction down and she sets your golden depiction of Shantea up uh, right outside of the front door. And then she goes over to another nail and she sets the stone depiction up. So now there are two depictions of Shantea flanking the front door. And she, she picks up the bucket of water and goes inside. Um, you guys in, in the next you know half hour or so, you're able to kind of like wake up at your leisure. Um, Jaunt, you say your morning prayers. Uh, you're, you feel fulfilled. Uh, the blessings of your God invigorating you and, and the knowledge that he bestows upon you. Um, you also see uh, Ernest, the wizard, uh, kind of just sitting um, on his bedroll in the barn. And he, he is looking through his spell book and you see him just kind of muttering to himself like you see his lips moving as if he's reading out loud and, and kind of he closes his eyes and then he, he turns the page and he looks and turns the page. And it, it takes him a little bit of time as well um, doing that. Um, but as you guys kind of do your, your various morning preparations, um, you, you pack up your stuff and... Um, the uh, the older of the two cousins, Karov, comes over, and he he says, uh, "My friends, please, my, my mother has prepared a breakfast. Please come inside." And he smiles, and um, you guys go inside. She has a big heaping bowl of just steaming oats, and there's there's fruit. Looks like like dried uh, fruit and berries, kind of like mixed into it. Um, and you see like a wooden bowl with just a big chunk of, of wax straight off of a, a beehive, just dripping with honey and fresh steaming hot bread 
and a, a little bowl of, of butter that looks like it was churned like within the last day. Um, and there's, there's mugs of uh, cider, there's apple cider. And then you see another, she brings out this kettle and sets it down and there's just steaming hot eggs. And she's like, please come sit. And she serves out plates full of breakfast for you guys. And you guys just dig in and you have, it's, it's like better and fresher breakfast than anything that you had had in the inn in Flan. Um, and you guys are there and they're just kind of chatting and they, they tell you about, you know, kind of their, their farm life and, you know, all the different things that they do. And they say that there's, you know, a few other families that have scattered farms, but this far out, it's, you know, just dangerous with, with all of the different kinds of um, orcs and other creatures and threats that exist to the east over in Thar. Um, but uh, they're, they're just kind of chatting with you guys. So um, do any of you do or want to say or discuss anything before you guys head out on the road? Uh, if I can gracefully work it into conversation, I, uh, want to see if we can find out any, anything about the Anthony family or Anthony Manor without, uh, setting off any red flags, like, you know. Okay. Uh, um, maybe. so you're having breakfast. She's talking about neighboring farms and stuff. Uh, I wonder, good lady, if, if uh, you hear of a family called the Anthony family in these parts. She, she looks up and she's like, well, well, yes, uh, to the north. They were a noble family that owned vast tracts of land to the north for many years. In fact, my husband, as a young man, uh, worked their land um, before earning enough coin to, to buy this property that we, we have for our families. They were very prosperous. But we hear tell that they no longer occupy the area. Yes. Well, we have not been that far north. Um, we've never been um, graced with the presence of any of that noble family but we've we've heard rumors from travelers and, well maybe i guess about 10 years ago it was said that they something terrible happened some kind of curse and they 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 left they left their home and that no one knows where they went they just disappeared all of them well that's what what we've heard over the years. Mm. Their land was was beautiful, though. It was, it, you know, kind of a hilly area because it's not too far from the Thar, um, but beautiful, rich, fertile soil, especially for this area, for this far north. Um, I'm not sure what would have compelled them to leave, but the family manor was was a, a beautiful building, if I remember correctly. It sat kind of on top of a of a rocky hill, and it kind of overlooked the the valley and the the, the farmlands that they owned. Uh, there was a very large kind of main uh, building within the walls of of their land. Uh, and, and several towers, and I think one of them was like a bell tower, and then there was a granary, and they even had a, a if I'm not mistaken, a, a small family um, shrine to uh, to the goddess uh, Shantea. So they were okay. they were uh, as far as we knew, they were a kind family, and they were they they were well respected in the area um, for many decades. Just out of the curiosity, have you met someone that has been also asking about Anthony family? Uh, I haven't, no. And then and when she says that, you notice Karov kind of like perk up and he's like, and he goes back to eating his eggs. 
when? Uh, make an insight check. Okay, insight. I'm not so insightful right now. Ten. You don't see anything out of the ordinary. It's just he seemed to Shit. have his interest peak when you mentioned that. And then, like, he went back to eating. Um, a few moments later, um, as you guys are kind of finishing up, um, Karov says, um, he says, well, uh, I must head out and get the plow set up. Um, but I, I once again want to thank you on behalf of myself and my whole family for your kindness, all of you. You, you truly saved my, my cousin Sam and I, and, and there's no way that we can repay you. But if you ever pass through this way and you seek hospitality, it, it will always be here for you. Uh, and he bows and you see he goes and grabs some, some gloves and puts on his gloves and, and then he, he walks outside. Thank you for your hospitality, man. She, and he nods and she's like, oh, okay. Yes, of course. Um, you guys. And please, please forget we were here for your own good. She says, oh, okay. Um, okay. And she nods and um, Tompkins finishes eating and he's like, we should go. We can make good time. We can make it there before dark if we move quickly. And he, he gets up and he's like, ma'am, thank you. And he walks out. Ernest is like, thank you indeed. Your hospitality has been most appreciated on the road. And he, he gets up and walks out. Uh, Angler? I'm going to thank her in uh, Tompkins' voice. Okay. Pretty much just exactly what he said. She Do a little bow and... Um, Harley, you walk out as well. Thank you, madam. And I'm uh, racing with the uh, with the uh, ranger. <laughs> okay. Um, John, as you're getting up, she says, um, "Oh, she says for the road here," and she she takes one of the bundles of fresh bread and she she wraps it up in kind of a, an older but clean looking linen. And she goes over to her shelves and she grabs, she sees she grabs like a wedge of cheese. Uh -huh. and she takes the cheese and the, the um, bread and she hands it to you in this bundle. And she says, may the pilgrim watch over you. My, my husband was, of course, a devotee to Shantea, but he, he always uh, told stories of his reverence for Farlanga. Uh, I'm I'm moved once again, lady. Thank you. I'm I'm much much obliged, especially for this this treasure that you have bestowed upon me. We uh, be safe. Very important. Thank you. Our Take hospitality my is always here for for you. And she nods. Um, you go outside, and you see um, kind of about twenty feet away from the cottage, uh, you see. Tompkins is, you know, kind of slinging his bow uh, and he has his pack and Ernest is there and Engler and, and Harley are kind of all gathering. Um, and, and you see Karov is actually over by the barn and he's talking to um, Sem, his cousin. And, and you see like they're talking and, and then they, they kind of like nod and they walk over to you. And... Um, Karov says, he, he kind of like leans in and he says, uh, your friend was asking if anyone else had asked about the Anthony's. Yes. Well, there was someone. I just didn't want to say it in front of my mother. I see. Yester Ooh. Yesterday morning when, when Sam and I were working on the fence, there was a strange little halfling that was walking down the road all by himself. And he stopped by our, our farm and, and he asked if, if we knew how much further it was to the Anthony Manor. Hmm. 
Indeed. We were afraid of this. He looked harmless. I, I, I didn't really, I mean, until you mentioned that you were looking for it, I didn't think of any reason to, to tell you, but I mean, he didn't even have any, not like you guys, he didn't even have any weapons. He just had like a backpack and simple clothes on and Well, mayhap it's nothing, but uh, it's good information nonetheless. And I'm, I'm uh, grateful that you told us your, your honesty and forthcoming nature is a, a, um, it's an honor to your God and, and, and mine. And Thank the, you. The boys both say, "Thank you again," and you're always welcome here, priest. And they they nod and they walk off towards the fields. So with that, you guys kind of gather your party. You begin walking down the path uh, from the farmlands and kind of through their, their acres of property. And you get back to the main road that heads northwest. Um, and you continue traveling for um, a chunk of time. And in the afternoon, you arrive in kind of a more hilly area. You can definitely see the topography like kind of changing, like where, you know, as you're walking, like the horizon is more hilly. Um, and you guys kind of go up and down these little hills. And at one point you cross this little ravine that it's, you know, not like a major river or anything, but just like a creek that you kind of jump across. Um, the, 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 the natural life here also seems to be more verdant. It's, it's almost like a strange little microclimate where the, you know, the sun is, is out in full. The plant life seems to be very healthy. Uh, there's a lot of trees. And in the distance, you see uh, like an open stretch of land. And for at least several miles, for at least several miles, you see open land. And in the distance, like way off on a hill, you see the outline, the silhouette of buildings that look like perhaps uh, some kind of settlement, some kind of village, and maybe some kind of large keep. And that's off on the distance. And as you guys are walking towards it, Tompkins is like, I think that's it. I think that's, I think that's the Anthony Manor. It looks like a description. Indeed. And you guys make your way towards it. Uh, along the way, um, I made sure to um, pass along what Karob and Sam said about the, the inquisitive halfling, and especially to Mr. Tompkins so that he can uh, look on the road and see if the, the halfling left any tracks to confirm that he indeed is headed this way. Okay. With that in mind, Tompkins is kind of occasionally stopping and looking, um, and and he says, uh, "Well, it's hard to say. I see multiple tracks. I I even see some some horse tracks from maybe a week ago, but nothing heavy. There's no heavy boot traffic. So whoever it is must be traveling pretty lightly. Um, Halflings do, I hear." It, it doesn't help that his total role was a seven. Um, but you guys, you guys continue on and um, you, you don't sense anything strange about this area. Like, in fact, it seems really, really kind of nice. Um, and, and as you guys kind of cut across country now, um, the road kind of continuing north, but this plot of land to the northwest um, you were kind of walking through a valley. There are trees and, and flowers, um, and, and you see this green hill ascending up. And at the top of this green hill, you see a, a, a home that looks like it's been there for maybe a few centuries. You see a, a stone wall around it, um, and there's a large kind of uh, building that you assume is the manor. And then you see a couple towers uh, within this stone enclosure. Um, and you're assuming that this is is probably uh, the Anthony uh, lands, and you guys kind of 
hike your way up this hill. And when you get to the top of the hill, you see that um, the stone wall is about 10 feet tall. Um, and it, it looks like it's sturdy still. It's not like a ruin, but it's definitely in some disrepair, like it's, it's weathered. Uh, and some of the stones are, are missing mortar as if over the last 10 years or so, they have not been kept up. Um, and, and there are weeds that kind of grow along the outside of the wall. And it's very quiet. You don't hear any movement. You don't hear any people from inside of this, uh, this compound. Tompkins climbs to the top of the wall and he like, you see him kind of like perched up on the top of the wall, looking around and he says, he looks down at you guys and he says, it's empty. The, the interior yard is empty. It's overgrown. Uh, he goes, it looks like there's a gate that way. He goes, I'll, I'll open the gate. You guys meet me on the other side. And he jumps over the wall. Um, so you guys walk around the exterior of the wall and you see indeed a, a wooden gate. And again, everything around this is just overgrown as if like nature has just grown back. Um, there, are, there are weeds and tall grass kind of everywhere, wild flowers growing. And you hear a sliding sound, like a heavy wooden sliding sound. And, and you hear Tompkins grunting, and then you hear the, the sound drop. It sounds like a big, heavy board. And then the gate kind of creaks open, and Tompkins kind of pushes the gate open. And you see now that he's opened the gate for you guys that there's a big uh, wooden deadbolt that he's lifted off. And, and he says, come on in. It's quiet in here. I don't see anyone. I don't hear anyone. Uh, nonetheless, you notice that he has his bow out. So um, before you guys, you were in the interior courtyard. Um, basically, it's it looks like it's about 300 feet, or shall I say 100 meters. Um, and you see that the large manor house looks like it has been around for a long time, maybe a few centuries. Like the wall outside though, it is in disrepair. Um, you see like the, the corner stones especially are kind of crumbled. They're missing a lot of mortar. Uh, vines have grown up over the home. It, it still looks very beautiful, but this whole area just seems as if no one has been here uh, in quite some time. Okay um, guys, I don't like that. People won't leave such a matter without a reason. Um, Jaunt, uh, what, what are you doing? Um, what do you have? Uh, well, I, uh, I'll enter, enter the gate and just start, uh, I don't really have much of a tracking skill, but I'm curious if there's any evidence of this halfling having appeared or anybody else having shown up. Doesn't look, it sound, it sounds like when he opened the gate, the gate hadn't been opened in a long time. Yeah, and you're looking at the size of the deadbolt. You're not sure that there's any way that a halfling would have opened this deadbolt. Like, to be able to reach it, let alone lift it off of the latches. So, um, if the halfling's here, it's not through this area. Uh, you do see um, Tompkins begins kind of like searching the grounds. You see he's like doing that thing where... He, He's walking very carefully and kind of his eyes are scanning back and forth, looking for tracks around the grounds and through the overgrown weeds that are growing up. Uh, the cobblestone like path that looks like it was built that leads to the manor house is still visible, but again, there's like weeds and grass growing up through it. Um, Angler, what are you doing? Can I go towards the front door and just inspect the area around it. Okay. Um, you you walk up and there's a big set of sturdy oak double doors. And they are, you see the handle and it's apparently locked. You give it a gentle, quiet wiggle uh, and it, it's locked from the inside. Um, and as you were by that area, um, you, again, you see Tompkins kind of spread out looking around. Uh, Ernest is, is walking with 
um, jaunt and with uh, Harley. And um, you guys are kind of exploring the exterior of the house. Make uh, perception checks, um, all of you guys. Nine. Seven. Uh, Wrong numbers. 20 with my bonus, so dirty 20. Okay. Um, as you guys are kind of, you know, spread out around the front part of this, this uh, interior courtyard, uh, you, you notice again that it doesn't look like anything has been opened or manipulated, um, except John, you notice on the side of the building, uh, like while Angler is kind of by the front and while Tompkins is, is, you know, searching the grounds for tracks, you notice that there is one window on the side of the building on the second floor that is broken. Uh, like the leaded glass is still intact, but it looks like something broke through the glass and opened the window. None of the windows on the first floor are broken. And that is where we'll end this episode of the Moon Sea Adventures. Oh. Tune in next time to find out what the gang uncovers in the ruined manor of the Anthony family. See you next time. Well, hello, it's me, Wizzy. I'm back once again to remind you to subscribe and click on the notifications button and also watch videos that are over there. And then don't forget to tune in to the next episode of whatever show you are just watching and crafting videos and DM tips and pro tips for vlogging and all sorts of gaming things.